Alrighty, we're here. Um, I'm here with uh, Rid Van Manor, aka Rick Manor, as I know him. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, to some grandmaster. Yes, exactly. So, um, Rick, you, you and I have probably known each other for maybe about, um, it's probably been five, six years. Yeah, something about like that. Long, yeah. Yep. Um, and I, I guess, you know, met, met through probably some referrals of mine would have referred you to me. When I was at working at Mercedes Benz in Wollongong, exactly, yeah, and we sort of maintained the friendship. That's right. We've bought a few cars off you. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and it was a. I was telling you about the podcast the other day, and I, I was saying, you know, it'd be great to have you on, and you've been kind enough to join me. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. <laughs> so, um, I guess to start, you know, um, obviously, you now you grew up overseas. Yeah, no, till seven. I came here when I was seven. Okay, so where were you born? I was born in Turkey. Yep. Uh, it's a place called Sakarya, which is only about. An hour away from Istanbul. Yep. So we came here at the age of seven, which was 1970. Wow. And um, so when you came, uh, obviously your parents came with you? Yeah. My two brothers, which is I have an older brother and a younger brother, mm-hmm. and my mum and dad. Yep. And uh, did you guys come by plane? We came by plane, yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, I want to talk a little bit about that, but let's, let's go back even further. What would be your first memory you know, of when like right the first, oh yeah, the oh first yeah. thing you can remember. Can you remember anything about Turkey at all? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I mean, till I was seven, I thought the world was around my village. Okay. As you know, when you're a young kid, you think the whole world's around your village. And uh, in those days, there was no internet. There was nothing. All you you saw was trees, uh, cows. You know, we had lots of cows, sheep, uh, and lots of uh, plantations. Wow. My parents were farmers. Farmers. Yeah. And so. But, like uh, farming livestock or they they were farming uh, like uh, fruit 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 and veggies yep yeah and then what do you know what what made them decide that they wanted to then you know leave to come to Australia yeah well uh, we didn't we were very poor my parents were very poor mm. uh, they didn't have much they only had cup you know a bit of a couple of acres of land that they were sort of planting and growing veggies and and fruit trees of you know. They had fruit trees like apples and uh, I remember yeah, apples and uh, there was uh, walnuts we used walnuts. to pick every year, yeah. Yep. And uh, we had a small house but that's all we had and we had neighbours who were pretty wealthy that their parents and grandparents, have, they, they've been inherited from their grandparents and my dad used to walk, uh, sort of work long hours from you know, say about 5am till about 12 midnight every day and... Mm. It was just just a work look, looking after a few couple of cows that they had, a couple of sheep that they had, and uh, he just said, "Why am I a poor person? Why was I? You know, he was an orphan. He had he lost his both of his parents, mum and dad, at a very young age. Wow. Before he was six, he lost both of them. Yeah. So his brother uh, looked after him. He's an old had an older brother, which was twenty years older than him. Wow. Looked after him until uh, he was grown. But obviously, uh, when he got married to my mum, he. Uh, he wasn't given much. He was just given, uh, you know, a couple of acres of land that he he sort of uh, tried to live off. Yep. And then they decided to come here. I was seven. Uh, my older brother was sixteen, and my younger was brother was three and a half. My older brother was studying at high school, and I was studying at uh, obviously primary, primary school. school. Yeah. Yep. I was in sec- second class, and uh, they said, oh, we, we're going to Australia. We didn't know, even know where Australia was. And they said, we're going to get on a plane. I was so excited. I thought planes because they looked round. Yep. I thought, oh, how are we going to sit in this? You know, I thought we were just going to sit around like a, a circle. We're just going to lay in it and, and yep. fly. Yep. And then when we got in the plane, I was, wow, what is this? You know, I was yep. really surprised. It was my first time I saw a plane yep. with seeds and, and it was really good. Were you, were it was you a scared? long flight. I wasn't scared at all. I was one of those guys that had no fear. You know when you're young, sometimes you don't have fear. Yep. I remember as a kid, there used to be a graveyard not far from our village and uh, the the elders used to say to us, look, I'll give you one litter if you go all the, run all the way to that uh, graveyard and come back. And a lot of the kids would be scared to go because it's dark and, you know, yep. graveyards is a scary place, cemeteries is a scary, scary place. And I'd, I'd be just run back and... I just had no fear. I'd climb on things. I, I had no fear of anything. Yeah. Maybe that's probably why, I, you know, I just came to started doing martial arts. Yeah. So I, I guess, you know, I always uh, find this interesting. Like I think, because um, I've got an older brother as well, so he's seven years older than me. 
And then I've got um, like two kids so far. So I've got Cadence, the older one, and, and Harley, my son, he's, he's the younger one. Mm. And when I look at him, he's, he, I would say he's the same thing. He's got no fear. Mm. And I wonder it's because, you know, whether, you know, when you've got that older, older sibling, you sort of look at what they do and, and then you just, you want to emulate it. You want to yes, copy Yes, exactly. It. Helps. Yeah. Helps seeing what he can do and you go, oh, I can do all that. Yep. But you don't realise you're much younger than him, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Helps it's having it's an older a, brother. There was a big, big age gap, right? Yeah, there was nine years. Nine years. And um, I guess, you know, um, did you ever, like, uh, I guess to hit from his perspective, you would have been almost annoying, right? Because you always... Well, I, 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 I was and I wasn't. He, he loved me because I, I was that kid that had no fear, I'd do anything, <laughs> I'd jump, fly, you know, do anything that they wanted me to do. So I was sort of proud. Yep. My younger brother was a bit more younger, so he, he was, he was, uh, he was, he had that... No, he didn't fear too, timid. but he was timid. Yeah, yeah. not as um, the third one. Yeah, yeah, yep. Okay, and then um, so when you um, left uh, Turkey at seven, at the age of seven, right? Did you have any grasp of English or not at all? Not nothing. At all. Nothing. Just just learnt on the plane. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because everyone was saying as you're going past, excuse me, and I was wondering what that meant. <laughs> yep. And then please was the next word we learned. You yep. know, please, excuse me, please. So on the plane when we were ordering something, we, we'd you know, point out or they'd give us something and we'd say, please, please. And then I heard someone else say, thank you. And then that was my third word, thank you. Wow. <laughs> so on the plane, we picked up a couple of words. So And same thing for your parents, they didn't have any grass They had English? nothing at all. So then... Yeah, it was so hard. It was very difficult for them. Yeah. Like, but then how did they come to the idea that of all places in the world, they were going to go to Australia? Yeah, well, it was initially uh, a year before that they were going to go to Germany and my uh, <coughs> dad and mum pulled out because they didn't hear nice things about Germany. And then uh, we also heard about Australia having lots of uh, snakes everywhere. <laughs> was, that was the fear that people were saying, oh, snakes are everywhere and uh, that, you know, it's a big land. And my parents said, uh, then they pulled out of that as well. But then 1970, mum and dad said, look, let's... We're going. You know, we're going. Let's, we're going. Let's try it out. Yeah. So they came and they landed in Melbourne, mind you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, in so a hostel. We stayed in a hostel for eight days in Melbourne. Yep. So then what was, um, I guess, what do you remember about that? So you would have landed in this foreign country. Yeah. People are speaking a different language. Totally different because where we were, there was people from all over the world. Oh, wow. Okay. In a hostel, yes, hostel in Melbourne, right. yeah. Yep. And we stayed there eight days, which, you know, we didn't go to school or anything. We are just sitting around my... Dad went and found work, but we had a friend that lives in Sydney they, mm. from the same village. He was much younger than my dad, and he was a single guy. And uh, they've got in contact with each other. Yep. And he came and picked us up from Melbourne. Wow, came yeah. and picked you guys up from Melbourne. Yeah, picked us up. And then yeah, what, drove, us, drove to Sydney? Drove here, Sydney, yeah. Yep. And we lived in Redfern for a while, for a few years. And those days in Redfern, it wasn't, it's not like now where you can go and have coffee yep. and you know, so many nice restaurants. Those days are a bit more rougher. Yeah, very rough. Yeah, you know, there was people was asking, I'm not going to say who they are, but they were asking me if you got two bob, mate, you got, you know, you got a cigarette. You, yeah. So my mum and dad, so at one stage, they were scared to tra uh, travel around, travel to the, the yep. station and back because they had to walk to the station to go to work. Yep. And so, what did they what did they do for work when they when they got here? Well, my dad, uh, he's, he's, he worked in a couple of jobs actually. He, there were jobs everywhere those days. They would, you know, in the morning they'll start at one f factory, they wouldn't be happy, and then they'd go to another factory and start work there because the, most places had, you know, uh, signs saying requesting people to come and, and work. work. Yep. Yeah, and I, I personally went to school like I went to uh, Berkshire Public School at the age of seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, second class in Turkey, I left the second class, so I came back here and started second, second class. class as well. Yeah. I was the only kid at that year. I was the only Turkish kid in the whole school. Well, and being uh, from Turkey, I was getting picked on by because of the Anzacs yep. and because of the word Turkey. Yep. Young young kids, you know, three year olds, they didn't want to bully sorry, you, yeah. year threes, fours, and fives, and they were bullying me all the time. It was so bad. Yeah, <laughs> I was crying at some stages, and I don't normally cry. I was just getting frustrated, frustrated. That, uh, yeah. why are they picking on me you know why me type of thing yeah but uh i said i've got to do something i used to come out my younger brother that was staying at home all by himself at the age of three and a half wow by himself yeah and i go to walk to school from you know it was about a k yep. away 
I used to walk at the age of seven, yep. walk to Burke Street Public School and then uh, do my schooling School, and then come walk in. back. Yeah. yeah. And did you find, um, obviously, I think when you're younger, it's obviously very easy to pick up language. Oh, yeah. So, very easy. So straight away you started Straight away. It was, it was so good. After two weeks, my parents would ask me, you know, we, we, they were taking us places just to interpret for them. Just after two weeks, they were watching TV and they said, what are they saying? What are they saying? You know, and then you guys would be explaining it to trying them. Trying to explain, but you missed the, the movie because you're trying to explain what they were saying. Yep. But it was it was all good because being a kid you learn very quick. Yep. You know, I was just in a couple of you know months I was okay. Yep. Start to express myself and the school was good because there was no other Turkish kids which made it easier for me to learn quicker. Yeah, rather than speaking Turkish to all your Turkish all mates. the Turkish <laughs> mates. Yeah. So then, um, was that was that sort of your first experience with racism when you went to school? Or yeah, that was the first. And look, uh, good come out of it because of that. I said I have to do something myself so i started uh doing judo yep and i started doing boxing yep because these are two sports that were free yep because my parents came here to save money they were only here for two years they said we'll stay oh, two years wow. okay and then we'll go back to turkey make yep. some money go back to turkey and build a nice house or whatever yep and continue our life in turkey yep that was <laughs> you know in 1970 still we're still here yeah i mean mom i lost my dad my dad passed away here but mum's living in Turkey at the moment. Okay, so she went back. Yeah, she went back. So then, um, I guess you know, after those two years, like, what, what, what did they just turn well, around and say? Two, oh, we're, we're two, happy now. two years later, we went to Turkey for a holiday. They, we went yep. and uh, we stayed there a fair bit, and uh, but we came back. And they yep. said, "No, we'll, we'll come back and earn a little bit, earn a little bit more money." Yep, a little bit more money. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we got used to it. Our education was here, so yep. they. You know, they just kept us here for a while. And I continued my... Uh, then, funny thing, after doing boxing and judo, mm. uh, no one was bullying me at school. <laughs> and I said, well, did wow. You, did you get into any fights at school? Yeah. There was a few. Yeah, I had to point, you know, I had to put a few points. <laughs> I made my point at one stage and no one was... Actually, it was, uh, it was more so in high school. I was getting more bullied because at the primary, it wasn't so bad. Mm. Just, it's just, just name calling, bag, is yeah, it? yeah, swinging around. But yeah. high school is a bit more yeah, physical, full on. Yep. full on. So I remember year seven. I started year seven, and there was this guy who was bullying everybody. He was in year eight, but big bloke, big fat bloke. He used to bully everybody. So I beat him up once, and then I was the hero. <laughs> <laughs> so it was good, thanks to martial arts, you know, <laughs> and thanks yeah. for not having fear helped yeah. me out. Yeah. yeah. And what would you? How would you like as a um, as a school kid, like, what would you? How would you describe yourself? Like, did, were you academic? Did you study much? Or I, I didn't study much. I was I was more more of that fighter guy. I just wanted to fight because I got bullied so much that I wanted to get my frustration out. out. Yeah. Yep. So we were fighting. I was fighting, but I was more so fighting in the ring, like boxing yep. and judo. But look, look what come out of it. You know, if, I suppose if I didn't get bullied. I don't know whether I'd be still doing this business. Yeah, you know, it's, it's yep. become a great business. Yeah. So, uh, but I was I was academically okay too. Like, I wasn't a, the brightest of kids, but yeah. I wasn't the dumbest also. Yeah, I find I find it. Um, you know, it's one of those things that you know, whenever anything negative is happening to you, right? You've got a choice as to whether you use that as fuel f- to do something constructive, yeah. or fuel to do something negative. Right. Well, that's what I've learned about that after this, uh, after the age of about 18 because I started teaching at the age of 18. I started having my own club mm. at the age of 18. And uh, I realised that if it wasn't f- for the bullying that I copped as a young kid, would I have been doing martial arts? And uh, going throughout the years, like, you know, 16, 17, you, you're a kid, you're going out to clubs and having that confidence... Mm be able to stand up to yourself not don't have any fear i know like there, there used to be a lot of fights those days mm. and people who used to fight mainly it was one-on-one type of thing not yep. like now they never used to yeah, like sell, a gang fight. yeah gang fight like it'd be one-on-one yeah sort remember. out your problems and yeah sort out shake the guy's hand or you know shake their hand and come and i'll buy you a beer or yep. that attitude it was, it was great but i realized it wasn't the way to go like fighting wasn't solving anything yeah so um, because I compete in tournaments, that made me more of a sports person mm. than of a street fighter. Oh, yep. You know, you shake hands before the fight or bow, respect yeah, the guy. And then when it's finished, yep. and then you shake their hand back to, back to your training. 
and I realized that fighting doesn't resolve, especially physical fighting, does not resolve any any issues. Mm. So I thought the best way is to talk about it. Mm. And as I was training at uh, martial arts, my uh, instructor said to me, he always wanted to teach. He always wanted me to teach, but I never wanted to teach because I wasn't bad at, at martial arts. Pre, pre, I'm not saying I'm not bragging, but. Uh, I was, I was okay in martial arts. So anytime a new beginner would come, he'd say, "You take him and you take him and shame the reps." Yeah, but yep. it's and knowing teaching a beginner is not easy. It's, mm. it's very difficult. So I said, "I'll never teach. Yep. I'll never. I'm not going. I'm never going to teach." You know, <laughs> you should never talk big. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's one. Oh, oh, I think um, with anything, right? Like it's one thing when you're learning and you develop a, a certain level of ability, mm. and then but to to have to be able to explain that to someone else requires a different level of understanding especially right? if if they uh, if they're beginners if they've never done and there was a lot of people that had you know had done no martial arts skills yeah. or fighting skills or stands yeah. like some of them didn't even have coordination so getting a person to stand on a uh, you know guarding stands was a bit difficult and so oh man oh you're getting them to throw <laughs> a kick and they they, they just wouldn't learn and you go, oh, you get frustrated because it's not your business. And you're young, you, you know, you're 15, 16, you're 17, you're just going, oh, can't, yeah, can't, can't take, do take this anymore. Yeah. You know? I, 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 I remember, well, so when I was, because I was helping to teach Kung Fu as well yeah. at, at, our, at um, my master's school. And um, for a few years, I was, I was teaching this, this um, uh, guy with Down syndrome. Yeah. And... Um, you know, it, it was very, it was challenging because obviously, you know, their their concept and ability to grasp concepts is is, is very limited. Yeah. Um, but I guess you know, ultimately, um, you know, to be able to, uh, to me, I was proud of it. You know, because uh, he spent you know quite a few years with me, probably maybe two to three years training with me, and um, you know, uh, he, he he started to get some things. And obviously, he couldn't grasp everything. Yeah. Um, but you know, um, it was good for his health, and you know, he's active. Oh, that's and, great and for me. Now, it's, I love teaching. Uh, Down syndrome people, or you know, people yeah, with your disabilities. Disability people. I, I love it. It's a challenge for me now. It's more than anything now. I love, especially when somebody has issues or special needs. Uh, I sort of uh, get my instructors to work on them more because it's a great feeling to change someone's life. Yeah, and then they get that confidence, and you actually mm. see them change as a result yeah. of it, right? Yeah. So, um, okay, let's t- let's talk a little bit about um, uh, about high school, like so. Obviously, in high school, you know, you, you found that you were getting into quite a few fights. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, once that sort of settled down and you were you sort of established yourself, you know, people had you had probably had a bit of a reputation. Yeah, I, did, didn't I want did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they used to call me the Turkish kid. <laughs> <laughs> the Turkish kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was good. And um, I guess did you um, like did you have any idea what you wanted to do in the in terms of your future? Like well, well, what happened was uh, we started high school and then we are playing soccer. I was also playing soccer at the time mm. for a team and a uh, f- bunch of friends said, look, why don't we go and do Take One Dope? Because we first went and saw a Bruce Lee movie at the age of 12 and thought, wow, this guy's amazing. Yep. He can the kick. kicks. Yep. Because we just, judo, it just involves throwing, throwing and boxing yep. only. In your involves, hands. Yeah, hands. So I said, wow, uh, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to kick. So I went and, uh, you know, well, after seeing that movie, there was about 15 of us friends. We went and started Take One Do. We wanted to start Kung Fu, but Kung Fu was very expensive at the time. It was, mm. you know, if my parents were getting 38, my mum was getting $38 a week, and the monthly fee for uh, Kung Fu was $38. Mm. So my parents weren't going to pay that. No. You know, they had to save money. Yep. So I, Take One Do was, my brother was doing Take One Do, but he did it before. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I we said, let's go and do Taekwondo, not knowing what Taekwondo was. Yep. We thought it was a lot of people didn't know what Taekwondo was no, uh, was till year two thousand yep. when Lauren Burns won gold medal in the Olympics. Olympics. Yep. We used to have to say it's uh, Japanese, you know, Korean karate. And yep. like, oh, okay. And then ever since then we started, lots of mates, and then friends dropped out at one at a time, one at a time, because it's not easy, especially those mm-hmm. days. It wasn't easy the discipline that you had to have. Like you, you make one little mistake, the instructor would just punch you, <laughs> or or jump on your stomach, or yep. kick you, and and the sparring was full on, like yeah, it's no, head hard sparring, head hard sparring. You know, it, it was hard. So myself and a friend of mine got black belts out of it. Yep, the rest just pulled out. Yep. Uh, it was good that I stuck to it. 
Yeah, I think that's a that's that's common in 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 a lot of martial arts schools. Like you'll have like a group of people start together because mm. it's something that they can do as friends. Yeah, friends and then yeah. you know of that say group of five people, you will only really get maybe one or two that will stay longer term and and treat it more for stay for the lifestyle. Yeah, right. So and I think you know people often often think about you know uh, martial arts as an activity, not as a lifestyle. No, that's um, right. We're trying to change that image. Like uh, we try to make that as a lifestyle, and that's what we do now. We in our them is we have lots of families who are doing it for lifestyle yeah more so than uh like getting fit getting flexible spending and being confident obviously yep. and spending time with other main yep. people yeah and then okay so um so when you left school um you were you you already so by that stage yeah when you would have left school you probably would have started like your, your instructor would have had you teaching a few people well what ha- uh, what happened was uh, i was well i was at the age of 12 when I started Taekwondo, I was also I had to pay the the fees, so I started selling newspapers. Okay. Year seven, uh, straight after school, I'd come to and grab my, you know, Actually trolley yep. and, <laughs> and start traveling around the streets with your whistle and selling newspapers. I did that for two years, and then uh, I was at year nine. Um, I left school. You left school. Yeah, at year nine, and then I went to work at this chocolate factory, Rone Tree Hamley Chocolate Factory, because I needed the money yep. to pay for my uh, martial arts yep. because my parents wouldn't pay for it. Yep. Because uh, they said, oh, "What's going to do to you? You know, it's going to you're going to be a fighter, and we yep. don't want you fighting yep. other kids." And and having three brothers, like two brothers and myself, three boys in the family, it's not easy for parents sometimes. Yeah. You know? So uh, I started working there. But I realised that I have to, to get my year 10 certificate. So at night I was going, during the day I was working and a few nights a week I was going to technical college to do my year 10 uh, certificate. So wow. I finished year 10 yep. and uh, I didn't go any further. Yep. But that was it. And uh, it just continued. And my instructor moved to Auburn. Yep. Uh, he stopped. So I stopped for about you know three months. Uh, and then I said, no, I've got to go. So he went to... Or, uh, or when he was yeah, at teaching Auburn, Auburn. Yep. teaching Auburn, so I went there every now and then. I was on a bus, traveling on a bus, <laughs> coming back. You know. And so you still, where we we still living in Redfern? Then? Redfern, I was living yep. at Redfern. Yep. And uh, before I was doing it, uh, there's a place called in town, the Liverpool Street. Mm. Uh, we were training there, and then obviously that instructor moved to Queensland. Yep. So I went to another instructor. Then that's when he went to uh, Auburn. So I started going there as well. He wanted to leave his school, and I said, "No, I don't want to teach." Mm. So the, the last thing I ever wanted to do was teach. So I, <laughs> I, I didn't teach. And one of my friends, he came up to me and said, "Look, our instructor is very proud of you. You know, he loves you, and one thing he wants from you to do is to uh, teach." Yep. I said, oh, "Because he's helped me out so much." Yep. I said, "I got to pay him back." So I said, "No worries." And then the place I'm in now, Marrickville. In uh, 4 February 1982, he found that place. He actually found that place. And uh, the community there, the uh, people that was around that area, they needed somebody because we're, you know, this summer it was a lot of uh, gangs and hangouts for mm. kids with no hope. No direction. Yeah, no direction. They had no guidance, no direction. They have they sort of asked if I teach there and then my instructor got in contact with them and got in contact with me and so... Uh, we started teaching there. I remember the first day I started teaching there was on a Tuesday night. We had 67 people, 67 wow. young kids who were all, you know, troublemakers. Yep. And so it was good. Did you, and so did you have, uh, would you, you would have had your fair share of people wanting to come and give you a bit of oh, a Oh, yeah. Challenge. Those days we had a lot of people coming to challenge you. And But it was even those kids that were in there I, from day one when they all sat down, I said, if I ever see any of you guys outside smoking or bu- hurting anybody i said i will hurt you guys and which i was yeah like if i heard someone say or oh, you know this guy punched me out or smoked i'd, I'd get him in front of everybody and i'd spar him full contact i used to just knock him out <laughs> people that didn't, parents didn't mind then yep. people wanted you to toughen them up yep. people wanted you to discipline discipline these kids and yep. that was the way that's the only way we knew to discipline them those yeah. days. Like now, you know, it's different. It's a very different it's environment different, now, right? Yeah. Those days, you know, it was full on. You, and the kid would just get back up. You kick him, it get back up. You yeah. punch him, it get back up. You yeah. know, you, you'd have a bleeding mouth, it'd still come back up. You know? <laughs> so it was great. Like uh, parents loved it. It was Thursday nights, were sparring nights. And, and most of the parents, the, the 
kids' parents were standing there watching their kids spar full on. Yep. Because they wanted their kids to be tough and yep. also had discipline as well. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, in 1982, when I started that place up, I only I said, oh, look, I'm going to do it for two years. Mm. I said, oh, I can't do it. At least that will make my instructor happy. And mm. It wasn't what I wanted to do because I was still competing in tournaments as well. Yep. So I said, okay, uh, after two years, I remember uh, one day I said, that's it, guys. It's over. I'm closing this place down. And so many uh, kids cried and the parents were saying, where are you going? Where are these kids going to go to? Yep. I said, oh, I've done my community. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't was, char- I was charging yeah. them peanuts, you know, yeah. not charging them at all practically. And I said, I've done my enough yeah, time. Yeah. yeah, community service. Yep. But there were so many kids and I did feel sorry for them because they had nowhere to go. It was a, it was a good hangout for them. An outlet. Because yep. they used to come at the training would start from six to eight, so they'd be there around five, five thirty, just hanging around, stretching, sparring, and then they're all tired when they were going home. So I said, okay. Then came back and continued training. So, <laughs> yeah, and still there today. Yeah, yeah. All those years on. All those years. Yeah, I'm grateful that I've changed. You know, I've met so many great people. I've met so many kids with uh, special needs. Like now that you got kids with. They say uh, hyperactive and all that. We didn't know what that was those yeah. days. We just knew that kid was, you know, had just energy. Was, uh, energy. Yeah. They were full of energy, or yeah. or we didn't know that kids had special needs because they all looked okay. Yeah. Like now they've got all these terms. <laughs> yeah, for to try and diagnose these. Diagnose things. each yeah. each issue, yeah. Yeah, each problem. And sometimes I think you know kids just need that that outlet and that focus. Something yes, to focus exactly. On. Something to focus. I want to guide them. Yeah, and I think you know um, it's 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 probably healthier from that perspective because as i said before you know there, when you when something bad happens in your life you, you you've got that choice as to whether you do something positive from it yeah, exactly. you know and and so you know sometimes exercise and martial arts can be that outlet to really push yourself and you know you might not be happy with yourself so you take it out in your body but in, in a way that is actually going to help your body as That's opposed right. yeah, to yeah. you know going and drinking or drugs or whatever which you know might make you feel temporarily better but there is no long-term benefit to it well a lot of my friends who i grew up with uh were drinking taking drugs smoking even my two brothers they were you know doing drugs and uh alcohol and i i i I didn't drink i didn't smoke so it kept me on my on the right path because i was the role model i was the instructor i was yep and when you're competing you got to always do the right thing Mm. and i i think uh god sort of made me swing into this way to do the right thing because you know I wasn't one of those guys that drank and took drugs and then gave all that up to do this. I was actually clean all along. Yeah, I was a clean guy. Yep. You know, so it worked out really well. I, f- I feel really, really uh, lucky. I feel uh, I've I'm sort of been blessed for this mm. martial arts because I had no fear. Like people that have got no fear usually get moved around like they either become security guards or bouncers mm. or bodyguards to some rich people or or get involved in drugs or yeah the, na- the bad aspects bad of aspects or but most of my friends that's what's happened to them because they can fight they can you know they can throw a punch they they thought yeah i'll go that far and become make money easy but yeah. i i didn't go that part maybe i had that i i feel sorry for people i've got that thing that Mm, empathy empathy yeah i yeah. i have that thing where when i was young yes i did fight but later on i realized hurting people is not a nice thing you mm. know so you, it's not you can't hurt people you got to love people you got to help people you got to respect people whoever mm. they are no matter what age group they are you need to respect these people mm. and i always like giving back to the community and mm. and the best way i could give back was by Helping these kids, you know, getting them off the streets, getting yeah. them, telling them that drugs was bad, and and kids would look up to you as an instructor. Imagine if I smoked, and I'm telling a kid to you know, yeah. stop smoking. You're not, you're not setting good. the right yeah. example. Or if I, I'm getting drunk and causing problems, I'm fighting everywhere, and the kids saying, "Look, you're doing it. Why can't I do it?" Mm. So they had no leg to stand on. When I said not allowed to smoke. Uh, they can't say to me, why are you, are you smoking? smoking? Yeah. You guys, look, I didn't mind them drinking one or two, but some kids would just, you know, they'd, they'd be just drinking on, you Don't know, on the side there and yeah. it just didn't look right. And then they'd be okay for a while and then they'll pick on somebody or bully somebody or hurt somebody mm. or, or knock off someone's bag or go and cut slash tires. Mm. And 
it just it wasn't right. So, did you ever have um, times when, like, so you know, when you when uh, like sometimes when you're very you know straight in terms of how you want to b- manage your life and things like that, um, did you have any times when that was a bit challenging and you're like, you know, oh, I've, I've been like this for for so long and then I need to have a break or you know like your, your motivation sort of dies down tra- a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of of course, you know, when you when you're sort of training, because martial arts training is not easy at first. So you know yourself, you've done it mm. yourself. And uh, at times, you, you know, you train, you train, you train, you're trying to do the right thing. Then you got your friends who are drinking, and, going you know, out, going out. I mean, I was going sacrifice, out. Sacrifice, right? Yeah, yeah, I was going out. I was going out with them too. I was. There were so many nights I'd go out, stay till morning, and and then come home and go straight to work, or from <laughs> from nightclub straight to work many yep. times without any sleep. But the good thing was that I wasn't drunk. Yep. Like I could do all that. I was always sober. And uh, I remember getting really drunk once, and apparently I had a big fight. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I a friend of mine told me this a few years later. He said, "Man, you're you're amazing." And apparently, he said, "You saw me, uh, you know, four guys picking on him." Apparently, I just went and finished the four so, guys off and came back uh, into the nightclub. You have no I recollection said, of it. I don't. Uh, I, I I don't even remember it. Yeah. So maybe it's good that I did not drink because you can become very yeah, aggressive lethal, or aggressive, and all yep. that. And uh, and that was at a friend's uh, engagement party. At an engagement party at a nightclub, and wow. uh, so you got a drink, and we mixed all the drinks: wine, champagne, yep. scotch, you know, tea, Marie, and milk, and anything. It would be that <laughs> that. And uh, how did you feel the next day? <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it was bad. And I said, "Man, how do people put up with this every day?" And the funny thing was, well, my friends used to smoke dope. Yep. And they said to me, you've got to try it, it's good. So I tried it once and my head started spinning. There was a whole bunch of us. There was about, I don't know, 10 of us circle and it came to me. I tried it. They said, how are you feeling? I said, oh, my head's spinning. They said, that's good. I go, what? Are you guys stupid? <laughs> I said, I'm going to pay money and have my head spin? Yeah. Like I, I can do that doing rolls on the floor. <laughs> I said, I don't need this. So I, I never touched it since. <laughs> you know? It was just stupid. To me, it sounded like, you know, you're paying so much money to get high you can become high mentally. Mm. You know, I was one of those guys that self motivation. Yeah. I can get myself happy. Like a lot of my friends, when we used to go out to nightclubs, they'll have to have a few drinks to get mm. their confidence. Yep. And I didn't need no confidence because I you was always have, a confident yeah. kid. And, yep. and, and mind you, if, if we wanted to pick uh, talk to a girl, I'd just walk up to them or, you know, had no, no, no fear of talking to anybody. Yep. Like I'd always find a way. To be talk to the prettiest girl, yep. you know, it was always a challenge with friends. You know, yes, eighteen, nineteen, man, tonight the prettiest girls is going, going yep. and I'm going to end up with her. And obviously, everyone goes for the prettiest girl, mm. <laughs> but it's just the, it's uh, just life. And and my mates would be drunk, and me, I, I'd be sober. They go, "Come on, man, you you, you got to yep. have a few drinks." I go, "No, I'm not drinking, yep. and I don't need to drink," which was great. You know, was, uh, I'm glad that I didn't drink. Yep. I. You know, occasionally I'd have, if, if it was a special occasion, yeah. like, you know, birthday party or this, I might have a glass or two, but yep. that, that was it. That was about it. Yeah. So then what about um, when, you, when you're when um, you doing tournaments and things like that? Mm. Did you ever get nervous? Oh, you do get nervous. You do get nervous till the referee lifts the hand up as soon as you throw that first That's, kick. Yeah, then you're on autopilot yeah. after that. But yep. before that, you do get nervous because even though it's a fighting sport, you know, one mm. little... You close your blink, you could get hurt. Yeah, you know? so yeah. you do get nervous. Uh, it always plays with your mind. Yeah, it does. Yeah. What if? What if? What if I lose? You know, the fear yeah. of losing because I'd never lost, and the fear of losing was always getting you. Yep. What if I lose? You know, but if you knew the guys, it wasn't so bad. But yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm I think everybody has fear. Yeah, I, like see, I, I'm um, when when I compete, I, I sometimes will get like this. Um, I try and get myself into this, I guess, a state of focus, right? Where where it's like, okay, you know, when I'm when I'm there, I'm on, you know. Yeah. And then and then I, I did a, I did a couple of um, grappling comps where I was probably a bit complacent, you know, and I was just like, ah, yeah, whatever, you know, like just go in and and, and, and a bit complacent, and then like I, I lost my first matches as a result of it, and then I was like, you know, like fuck to myself, I was I was just so angry at myself, yeah. and then and then now I now when I think back on it, I think you know, as a mindset kind of thing. Um, that complacency is almost disrespectful. That's right. Right. Is that it's, to it's, yourself? Yeah, it's disrespectful to me. It's disrespectful to my opponent. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because at the end of the day, you know, um, if if I'm gonna if I if you choose to compete, 
then you need to be really respectful different. about what competition re- um, represents, yeah. right? That you're trying to do your best, they're trying to do their do best, best, and the better person will win. Exactly, and don't take it too lightly. You should never take competitions too lightly. That's why I was always ready. That's mm. why, I like, you know, when, when we used to go out, people used to say, have a drink. I go, no, I've got a comp coming up. And yep. that was a great excuse. Like, when I used to meet, when I used to meet girls, they said, why are you drinking? Mm. You know, you're supposed to drink. Yep. I go, I've got a comp coming up. So it was a great excuse yep. not to, to also it. drink at the time as well. But did, did you have to cut much weight when you were competing? No, no. Those days, uh, we didn't have... The funny thing was, in, in my time as a young kid, when we were growing up, uh, it was always the same guys that we used to compete against. Yep. And uh, you used to wait for a new black belt to come up so you can spar someone <laughs> different <laughs> in the ring. This was mostly the same yep. people that you've you're competing and you knew them so they knew you they'll be training so you'd be training yep. i mean those days like we didn't train six seven days a week we trained two nights tuesdays and thursday and friday was our sparring night at, at our martial arts center so we do full contact you know, contact yep. sparring so you're always ready it's not like now they train six days seven days a week two mm. sessions a day mm. they do it professionally we didn't do it professionally but our opponents didn't also do it professionally yeah. as well so, so it's, you're it's still at the same a level, level playing field yeah there was yep. the same level of playing field yep. you just focus more and you train more you did the right thing some of your competitors they drank they didn't care they just came and competed because the instructor said oh we have a competition comp, yeah. yeah you want to go in and said yeah I, yeah i'll go in I, I never went in a comp half-heartedly. It was all full focus. Because yep. I didn't want to take the chance of losing yeah. or, or getting hurt. You know, you can get hurt. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I had a, I had a good mate um, in high school, Ricky, uh, who was also, you know, competing in Taekwondo quite quite a lot back then. And, um, you know, I, I'd still remember the weeks when he, when he in the lead-up to his um, tournaments, he'd be, all he'd be eating was rice crackers. And I'm like, yeah. Ricky, man, that can't, that can't be healthy for you. And he's like, yeah, but I've got to lose weight <laughs> to try yeah. and make weight. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I I was okay, and I used to also do weights to uh, just to be, look good, look, mm. try to have that Bruce Lee body, and then later on try to have that um, uh, Van Dam body, you know. Mm. But I was very lucky; I was very flexible too. Yep. Even before you saw um, Van Dam do splits on chairs, I used to do them as well. Yep. I used to do it on chairs, and 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 you you know him. Yeah, yeah, I met him. Yep. I met him a couple of times. I met him in Malaysia when I went to. Uh, I used to go to Malaysia to give seminars on flexibility. Okay. And the guy that invited me also, he was also making movies. He was there to make do the double impact movie. Ah, okay. So we had a bit of a chat. He's a great guy, but that's going back a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My son was only I think four at the time. Now he's thirty two. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> so that's twenty eight years ago. Yeah. Well, see, he's like the, he's got some very iconic movies when you think of like Bloodsport. He's great, he's great. Yeah, like the, those movies back, like Kickboxer, yeah. Bloodsport, were my favorite. Yeah. Well, so when when I was growing up, like those movies, oh, it was the best. Like, yeah, Bloodsport was one of my favorite movies. Yeah. So. Same, same. I mean, your era would have been Van Damme. My era was Bruce Lee. Yeah. Yep. So, but I, I love the blood sport. When uh, one of my students, I was teaching at Cabramatta at the time, and uh, one of my students was talking about the blood sport. He goes, Oh, so you have to watch this, a great movie. <laughs> I said, Okay. And then oh, I said, Wow, this is good. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then the kickboxer was great. I loved all his movies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he had a good run. Then he had yeah. like Universal Soldier. Soldier. Yeah. I don't, I don't like those ones. Double Impact was good when he, when he was playing both characters. Both characters, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I, um, my, I applied for a role in uh, Universal Studios because it was shot here in Australia. Yep. I heard about it, so I went to the agent. And uh, they said, what can you do? So I did splits on chairs, and the lady behind the camera goes, wow, I, I didn't think this was real, that people do this in real life. I go, yeah. it's simple. Anyway, I filled out a form. They said, do you have an agent? I go, no, I don't have an agent. They go, oh, do you have insurance? I go, no. I said, I just came off the street. One of my friends told me... <laughs> Actually, it was one of my students told me that there, were, there was a you know they were looking for people, and I went, but it was too late. Everything had done. I was if I had been, I could have been joined an agent. I could mm. have joined uh, the insurance, but I didn't even have, I didn't know nothing about. It, so I said I'll just yep. apply for it. Yep. But I uh, you know <laughs> yeah, didn't get a role in that. So um, okay, so when when let's let's go back to um, you know you, you you thought after two years of running that the, the, the academy that okay that was it and then you've changed your mind you've gone back to it gone back to it yeah so were you, you were working full time at the same time I, I've you? always worked full time for like I was doing I was working at that time I was working at a place called Davis Gelatine so uh, when I was 15 I worked at um, Kellogg's sorry not Kellogg's I worked at uh, Chocolate Factory right, Rontree Alley for one year mm-hmm. then I started working with my dad 
uh, at, at the age of 16, I started working at a place called Davis Gelatine. Mm. I was there for 11 years, from 16 till 27. But at the same time, I was, you know, training till 18. And at 18, when I started teaching here, so mm. during the day, I'd be working at Davis Gelatine, and at night, I'd be uh, teaching martial arts. Mm. And was there any sort of, like, when you, when you were um, doing your day job, was there any sort of lessons that you learnt there that, you know, you took back with you to martial arts and, you know? Well, I've learned that you got, you know, working in a factory was a factory, so seeing people, how hard they worked, and mm. I said to my mind, I said, I have to be successful. I had to, you know, I, don't, I, I have to be, like, I have to do the right thing. But those days, everything was ma- practically manual. Mm. Now you've got machines doing everything. Everything. Don't forget, I'm talking about, uh, you know, 40 years ago now, so everything was manual use, has to push things, cut things, you know, carry things. Mm. I was a forklift driver there. At later on, I became a forklift driver, which made it much easier. But uh, the worth ethics it gave me strong worth ethics. Uh, that I, I, you know, I was working hard, mm. and at the same time, like martial arts, training, physically working during the day, and then training at night. And don't forget, I started the gym too. So. In between, I was going to the gym. My my class would start at six, so I'd finish at work at four, go straight to the gym. Yep. You know, train for an hour. It was at uh, Broadway Gym from Redfern. I was going to Broadway Gym, mm. and then coming here teaching. Yep. So yeah, it was it was good. Yep. And then, um, so then, uh, at what point did the did the kids come along? Well, uh, I was doing that for a while. I was you know twenty twenty one competing and uh, just. Fighting our t- club was just a competition school. All we yeah. did was compete. So it was all just for tournament all competition. Fighting. Yeah, it was yep. all tournament fighting. I, and when people wanted to start, I remember, you know, I had one tournament. I had about ninety-eight students. I had ninety-one in a tournament. You know? <laughs> that's, you a, know, that's a busy day. Yeah, it was a busy day. <laughs> and I used to say, to, "You want to, you want to train here? You have to fight in tournaments." And so we, that went on for a while. And then uh, nineteen eighty-two and nineteen eighty-six, I went to Turkey. I got married yep. to my wife. Yep. And 1987, my young son was born, and that's when I changed. And I said, when my son was the first day that he was born, I said, "What am I doing?" I said, because I remember uh, growing up, our instructor used to say, our Korean instructors would say to us, "If anyone ge- looks at you funny, you smash him." Mm. And so we were teaching the kids that. I said, we used to say, "Look, if anyone looks at you funny, if anyone wants to hurt you, you hurt him back." Yep. You know, never turn the other cheek. Yeah. You know, they say yep. when someone hits you, turn the other cheek like the Bible says. Yeah. I said, no, no, you got to hit him, you got to hurt them. But the day that my son was born, I said, is that what I want my kids to do? I, I don't want my yep. kids to fight. Yep. This is not right. So I changed the whole teaching aspect. I said, guys, you know, we only do, we fight in the ring. We don't fight anyone else. You know, you mm. try to talk your way out of, out of this. You talk to people and made me think more when I became a father. Mm. It was different when I was a kid. It's different. Like, it changes your life. The day that you, my son was born, I said, man, I've got to look at my life different now because I'm a, I'm a responsible yeah. person yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a responsible for the rest of my life. I've got to be the, the role model for this kid. Yep. So um, in 1987, December, he was born. And just then, uh, the funny thing you said that uh, I had a guy come from... Um, Malaysia to grade me for my fourth down and he had this guy from Hong Kong he was a Kung Fu master from Hong Kong he was there they both graded me for my, for my fourth down and I was pretty flexible had great body mm. you know doing all this thing just as my my son was born he said to my instructor said he should come to Hong Kong and fight in tournaments underworld tournaments yep. so he had to chat to me he said why don't you come to Hong Kong fight underworld you know under, underground yep. not like you know this cage fighting now yeah. Yeah, it, was it, was all, it was all just like, yeah, uh, for, for gambling and things yeah, like that. Yeah, it was yeah. underground those days. And he, they have asked me to go, he goes, look, I'm one of the head judges in those tournaments. He yep. goes, I'll get you in there, you can fight in tournaments. I was that close to going there. I said, I've got to prove myself. I said, I can do this. Yep. And then came home, talked to my wife, and she said, look, what are you going to prove? Yep. You're going to go there, fight, you've got to, you're a father now, you've got to be more sensible and all that. <laughs> and I, I turned that down, but I... If, whether it was good that my son was born that time, maybe uh, if he was born a few months later, I may have gone there and started fighting. Yep. Which uh, I'm not lucky I didn't anyway because you know you're fighting to, to really not to kill but to really hurt people, yeah. and uh, there's no practical 
uh, there, you know, rules in there. Yeah. Well, there's a point where where it's you know, the, um, I think when you're young, you 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 need that confidence to feed your ego. Yeah. But then at some point, you've also got to let go of the ego, right? You That's got, right. You know, gotta let go of that ego before it, before it, just like anything destroys you. Yeah. Right. When you take it to the extreme, or you know, um, it's like. You know, you, it's good to be obsessed with things, but when it becomes an addiction, it's probably too much. Too much. It's right? da- dangerous. It yeah. could take you to the wrong path. Yep. Yeah. 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 It was, it was a great feeling. So I wanted my kids to do martial arts. Well, my son was born. And uh, so I, at the age of what he was, you know, seven, eight months old, I was stretching his legs. <laughs> and when he was one years old, I, you know, I'd get him to kick, lift one leg up and, yep. you know, use it. And then when he was around two... I got him started competing at the age of four and a half. He was competing in tournaments. Yeah. I never forget. Uh, we had a tournament. It's four and a half. It's his first tournament. He's a blue belt. And those days, you had to be six to start martial arts because mm. no school would accept you unless yep. you're six years old. Yep. So we go to the ring and everyone's looking at this little kid. Who's this little kid from other schools? You know, yep. they're going, who's this little kid? And uh, so he goes in the ring. I, I, you know, we put his chest protector up. He goes in the ring and then... Just before the ref starts the competition, he comes back and goes, Daddy, he's too big. <laughs> Don't forget, the kid was seven years old. <laughs> but I go, yeah, but he's a blue, he's a yellow belt and you're blue belt. Blue belts can beat the yellow belts. He goes, oh, okay. And he just turned back and just destroyed this kid. <laughs> he just went. You know, a four and a half little kid, yep. he was just doing all this fancy stuff. Everyone was just saying, who the hell is this kid, you yep. know? Yep. And then after the, every tournament that he was in – as soon as he's, he's on the ring, everyone would stop, you know, and, and they'd come and watch him because he was using all this fancy stuff, you yep. know, because he was, I was getting him to spar the black belts. I was getting him to spar the older kids yep. because he was the only one that was four and a half. Everyone else was, you know, seven, eight, yep. ten, twelve. So it was good. And he, he started competing at a very young age. I never forget when he was 13, he got sick of it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, when you do it it's, for a long it's, time. Yeah, that's right. And it's hard because I think you know, you, you like as a as an individual, he he probably didn't know exactly what he wanted to do yet, right? No, he didn't. A lot of his friends were well. A lot of his friends were also doing. He made his friends intake one day. Yep. It was it was a thing uh, those days um, in the olden days where at our Marrickville branch, a lot of kids that grew up in their areas, part of their lifestyle, they used to come, come through their doors yep. because everyone used to talk about, oh, you got to do the you got to go and train martial arts. You got to go and do take one day. So they'll, some will train for three months. Some will train for three years. Some will train yeah. in between. But they all go through. All go through the door. Yep. So he made a lot of friends through there. Yep. And uh, all the people I met a lot of you know people through through martial arts yeah. as well because it was just a part of growing up for yep. these kids. And even to date, I see a lot of them. Oh, hello, sir. Hello, sir. And I just train. You know, this guy could be forty years old, and he could. You know, I used to train with you 30 years ago yeah. or 32 years ago. Yeah. Or, or we'll have people bring their grandkids, you know, saying, I used to train with you, you know, yep. now my grandkids training with you. So It's a great but feeling. It's though, a great it? feeling, you know, 38 years in the same location. It's not easy. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the I, – I, I remember once I was I was on the train. Um, I think I just dropped a car to someone. So I was taking a train somewhere. And then um, this – this um, I guess he would have been in uni by then, but, um, you know, uni student. It was only a few years ago. He came up to me and he was like, oh, uh, Johnny. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, do you remember me? And I'm like, oh, it's, you know, you, you look sort of familiar, but you've grown up so much. Yeah, like it's hard to, hard to you know, picture that that was, you know, the little kid was you. Uh, yeah. And he goes, oh, you taught me martial arts. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then we started having a bit of a conversation. I was just like, wow, you know, like – you know, sometimes I, I don't think we always realise sometimes the impact that we have mm. on, on people's lives and especially, you know, when they're young and impressionable and, um, you know, they may not continue that martial arts journey, you know, for their in terms of a lifestyle. Exactly. That, but yeah. that, that impression is still there, mm. you know, and, and hopefully, you know, whatever they put their, their mind to and their focus to, they'll be successful in whatever endeavour well, they I, go I through. Well, do, I do get a lot, of, uh, a lot of my students who come up to me and they say, so you've changed my life. You know, I was one of those naughty kids, or you, some someone would come and say, "Oh, so you changed my life." I was, I was a troublemaker, or I was going the wrong path, and you've guided me to do the right thing. I've, where have I own now is thanks to you because I've, you know, I worked hard and I wanted to be happy, positive about this. Mm. You know, I get a lot of these 
young kids making a lot of comments saying it's all good too. Like no one once ever said to me, oh, you used to punch us out, you used to kick us out. But <laughs> they always remember the good parts. Yep. You know, they say, oh, you've changed me. Uh, I was a troublemaker. I was doing – or I was in the path of committing a suicide. Yep. Thanks to you, you, you spoke to me. Because we do, you know, when I see kids that are – that look quiet, and uh, mm. I'd go and talk to him and say, yeah, "Okay, is everything okay?" Or yeah, you know. So you listen to him, and, and and you and you pick because you, especially now I've been on the in the game for so long that I see kids, I see people who are, you know, quiet or or you can sense that they've got something going on in their life. So you, or marriage problems, or divorce issues, or had a death in the family, or sickness in the family. You mm. go and talk to him. You try to comfort them as well. And, and they like, especially young kids these days, because I'm the grandmaster. Like when you talk to them, it's like it's their world. You know, mm. they you give them a high five. They go, "Oh, master, touch my hand." You yeah. know, so they look up to you, and and, and when, because they look up to you, trying to go at their level, mm. and that's what we teach to our students as well. Uh, sorry, our instructors to do the same. Go to their level. Mm. Kids look up to you. Kids respect you. Yeah, and you got to respect them as well. I always say to people, if everyone did martial arts, this, this world would be a peaceful place. Yeah. Place, exactly. Because yeah. true martial arts, they won't bully anybody, they won't pick yeah. on anybody, they won't do the wrong thing, they'll, they'll always do the right thing, mm. they'll help you in need. I always say to people, like especially um, elderly people, when I see elderly people out on the streets, I always try to say hello to them because mm. you don't, you know, this elderly person could have been a doctor or could have been a policeman or could have been yeah. somebody you don't know helped. what they've done now yeah. they're lonely no one's talking to them you don't mm. know what these guys are going through sometimes it, it, it can really take its toll so it's great to talk to these elderly people and respect these people mm. as much as we respect our young we should also respect our elderly people yeah as well. that's one of the things that you know whenever i whenever you and i are having breakfast you know I, I'm, I'm always like you know how does Rick know so many people? Like you just say hello to everyone, but yeah. maybe you're just saying hello. <laughs> but I don't. I don't think you. Know I know. I know. Yeah, I know most of them because they're living in the area. Like it was a great community. Everyone knows everyone, and yep. uh, and a lot of their family members would either train with us, or I always try to say hello to them anyway. If I see mm. a person lonely, all the you know, I'll just say hi. Mm. You know, and they always say hi because there's no harm in saying hello to people. Exactly. You know, it just yeah. puts a smile on their face. Good yeah. Or good morning. Yeah. That's right. It's 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 one of those things, that, and this is one of the things I guess with the whole um, coronavirus, COVID thing. Oh. You know, we lose that connection. Yeah, we have we have seriously we've lost that connection. People you know? are just running, sort of staying away from each other, not getting too close. Or oh, what if it gets me? You know, but yeah. uh, from a distance, at least say good morning. There's yeah. no harm in you know putting a smile on someone's face. Yeah, it's it, it's creating it created a whole bunch of fear that. I think divided a lot of people. A lot of people, yes. Yeah. yes. Um, but I guess you know we'll, we'll talk about the impact of, uh, on that on the school. But let's let's talk about um, growing the school. So obviously um, there was a, there would have come a point where you've gone, hey, I can now do this full time and not have to work a day job. Yeah. Well, what happened was I uh, I don't know. As a young kid, in my own mind, I always wanted to retire by the age of forty five. I said oh, I got to retire by the age of forty five. I want to have a nice house. I want to have a nice car. But uh, with any kid as a young kid you always want that ferrari or the lambo you know yep uh as a, but you want that nice house with the swimming pool around it and but in my mind i always said off oh, by the time i'm 45 i have to retire but then this is you know in my 20s when my son's born and then my daughter's born mm. they were born so i was continuing training and uh, doing two jobs i did two jobs for for a long time till 19 sorry t- 2007 so I continued training, teaching, and in 1998 it was a breaking point where um, to, one of my f- students was in the Australian national team and I was the coach. Mm. So, and the tournament, the world championships was in Turkey. Mm. So when we went, I left my – because it was in Turkey, I said, well, I'll take my family, my son, my daughter, my young son hadn't been born then. Uh, we said, we'll go there and at least – spend a bit of time there so I'd do the tournament and spend three months so i was away in turkey for three months yep and i left my marriageful school i was also teaching at uh cabramatta at the time i said to sorry not cabramatta cabramatta was given to someone else it was a uh, auburn school okay so uh yeah i said to one of my black belts you look after the school till i come back yep there was there was about 100 students in the school with 
uh, two classes each day, two classes on Tuesday and two classes on Thursday. So we went there. We stayed in Turkey for three months, did the tournament, had our holiday with our parents yep. and grandparents and all our friends and cousins, and we came back. When I came back, out of 100 members in the class, there was only 11 students left. Wow, they all just disappeared. Disappeared. 11 students in the class were two nights, still about one class each night. And I had a cushy job at Kellogg's. I was working at Kellogg's. I was I had a great job. Yep. And I said, okay, what do I do? Do I close this place down? This is 1998, don't forget. With 11 students I had. So I was in two minds. Do I close? But I love the sport. I love this, you know. Yep. I can do this. I can build this. So I didn't give up. So I still continued doing. You know, still working at Kellogg's. Still working at Kellogg's yep. and still teaching. So I built that up to 80, 100, 150, 200. And it was about 250, yeah, it was about 250 students that went by. Then Harkin, my son, had grown up. Sarah, who's been with me for so long, she's sort of grown up too. She's, she's about, you know, these are about 19 years old. Yep. And uh, a friend of mine, I don't know if you heard, a, a guy called Crazy John. Mustafa Ilan, it was Crazy John. He used to own Crazy John phone. Yeah, the phones. Yeah. Phone. It was, we were good the friends. franchise. Yeah, yep. franchise. And uh, a friend rings, because we're close friends. I get a phone call in the morning saying, we just lost Crazy John. I go, no way. Oh, just yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Away. Yeah. yeah. I go, just a couple of weeks ago, we were together healthy. It was, it was good, you know. Yep. He said he, while he was jogging, he died of a wow. heart attack. Yep. That morning, that really uh, got me thinking. I said, what am I doing? I said, I've got 250 students. Why am I killing myself? Mm. So I went straight that morning before I went to Melbourne to, his, uh, to see him. I went to Kellogg's and I got my notice in. Just that uh, day. Just like that. I was there for 18 years at Kellogg's. Yep. 18 years and three months and I went and gave my – everyone f- said, what are you doing? You've got a cushy job here. You're on a very high pay. I said, no. That's it. My notice in. You're done. That was it. Done. <laughs> so then I went to uh, the funeral and everything and I came back and I realised, hold on, I'm 45. My goal ever since I was a little kid was What's to give up 45. Yep. So, uh, yeah, and what you really want in life sometimes, you know, uh, can, can probably can can happen. Come, yeah, yeah, the universe can bring it to yep. you. The universe has it for you. So uh, from then on, we just built with my son, Hakan and Sarah. We started working hard and mm. building the class up. Now, you know, 20 classes a week, 30 classes a week, 40. Now we have 130-odd classes a week. Mm. So we built the uh, – and obviously then we had to start training more team members, more instructors. And uh, that was the turning point was 2007. 2007. Seven, yeah. Yep. And then um, I guess, you know, because you, you, you were running in multiple locations, right? So yeah, still, still we're still running in multiple locations. We still have Auburn. Uh, we had – Concord mascot, but as, as we speak now, one of our uh, friends who runs a martial arts school in Sydney, which was Sydney Self Defence Centre, mm. they've gone insolvent. Mm. So they always asked if we want to take over the building. So we we started. We are going to move our mascot school to a full time place there. Yep. At the same time, uh, uh, have that Sydney Self Defence Kung Fu program there as well. Yep. So keep the instructors. Yep. Keep some of the instructors to teach that program yep. as well. Yep. So those. People that have been training for so long in that area are not missing out. Mm. Because apparently, like he's retiring, the owner's retiring. Mm. So we're taking over that as well. So then, um, obviously, like the, the style of training and training methods have, have changed over the years. A lot, yeah. Like what, what do you think are uh, some of the, the big things that you think has, has changed dramatically over the years that you've seen? Okay, what, what the changes we've made, um, we've, uh, well, the kids now get bored quicker. Mm. So we had to constantly uh, make changes to our programs. Like in the olden days, it was two-hour classes or one-and-a-half-hour classes, and you did the same thing every day. Now we've got a, a 52-week curriculum where every week it's different, mm. like lots of self-defense, weapons. We've added uh, you know, tricking into it. We've added uh, yep. lots of kicking, punching, self-defense skills, and a, and a bit of games and life skills. So mm. our, our programs, what we teach – is we have a theme of the month like respect, for example. Everything we do is about respect or focus or, or it could be balance. You know, when you ask a kid what's balance, they think it's balancing on one leg. We talk about balancing your lifestyle, balancing what you eat, 
how much time you should watch TV, how much time you should read. We we uh, it, it's it's a different program. Whatever we do, it we try to channel to a kid that it's a lifestyle. You know, mm. training is a lifestyle. Teaching ways, our teaching methods are, are more of values. Mm. You know, we we our parents they value what they pay for. Yep, like they don't do the kids don't. I mean, every kid gets bored sometimes. Mm. Even my kids, they they get bored sometimes. With yep, it's just the way nature is. Kids got everything these guys. So we just constantly add add programs to it, add uh, styles to it. Like you know, some of our teens and ninjas classes, adults, we do a bit of grappling in there as well, which we never used to. Mm. And our self defense is more from the hapkido style of uh, self defense. Mm. And uh, yeah, the weapons, the the black belt beyond black belt programs we've added in there. The tricking, the acrobatic stuff that we do in there. So, a lot, a lot of even the games that we play are more resemble towards um, technique wise. Like it could be acting game, for example. Uh, the kids, they they think it's acting, but it's, we call it a movie game. You're making a movie. It's like defending yourself against four or five yep. people who someone attacks you, you throw a kick or punch at them, and the yep. guy falls back. And so it's 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 all about learning from these games as mm. well. And it, but you know, there's a game. There's a couple of games that I, I love, Bull Rush, for example. You know, the kids yep. are running up and down. They think they're running up and down, but, you know, you're trying to get them to sidestep and, yep. and, and learn from their games as well because a lot of kids these days, they don't have coordination. Mm. I think they spend too much time on, on their computers or yeah. on their phones. And it's, it's funny, I think I think we, like as coordinated people, take it for granted. Oh, we do, <laughs> we do. <laughs> Apparently there's a department, uh, called coordination department or something, and... In hospitals now where they teach kids for coordination really yeah okay that was you know we we became co- we had coordinate we had coordination when we were young kids because we were always, always out playing. on the street yeah yep. soccer cricket rugby yeah whatever we, play we could everything. do we play anything yeah 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 and it's all fun right like yeah, that's, it's, it's that's fun. how we what we derive as fun but i think you know nowadays we've got a lot of things that um are very flashy and draw your attention and, yeah and you know so rather than getting those opportunities like it's like when you set the benchmark for for, for something to be exciting to be so high oh, yeah. it's hard for anything else to hit that same benchmark you know True, yeah. whereas you know for us like the benchmark was very low so very low, yeah you didn't know any better <laughs> I, I i remember this story when i was a kid that um you know uh my so we used to live in st mary's uh, or st Clair, and um we had this carport so it wasn't a garage it was a carport and um i used to get the magnifying glass to to, to like you know try and Focus the beam and cook the ants. Oh, just as fun, right? Just like as, fun, as a bored yeah. kid, right? Yeah, like that yeah, was, that's what we found as fun. Yeah, you know. Um, but you know, I, slashing I, tires. You didn't do that. I, I, I didn't I, do the slashing tires thing. I know people used to put nails on the on the, the tires, and I used to hear a lot of bad stories. <laughs> people, I don't know if they still do, but I think they do graffiti's now. A lot of young kids yep. go, you know, doing graffiti's out some our buildings. <laughs> I don't know why people would do that. You know, hurt other people. Yeah, I just can't understand. I could never, I suppose, just through boredom. Yeah, I don't, and I think it's a, a probably a bit of uh, a lack of education. Education, yeah. You know, like we don't really, you know, in, in all the things that are taught in school, we don't really teach things like, hey, you know, uh, being respectful of, of of property and common property. You know, um, like there's a, I think there's an adage in, in business that we use that you know. When you make uh, everyone accountable, nobody's responsible. Yeah. So you know it's everybody's problem, but nobody's done anything uh, about anything it because everybody's exactly. just pointing the finger at each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, true. Right? Um, and and you know so like the more I think about that, when I when I what I think about is like you know even at, at the dealership, you know if I go to the bathroom and I notice that somebody's made a bit of a mess, then I'll, I've got to clean it. Exactly. Right? right. Like I feel like you know even though I didn't I didn't make the mess, yeah, but you're responsible. But I'm responsible for it. Yeah. And if I don't set that example, and I and it's okay for me to let it go. Yeah. then it's okay for everybody else to let it go, right? That's right. So, you know, um, yeah, yeah I, I use that adage a lot to, to try and encourage myself to, to do the right thing, you know, and, um, you know, if there's rubbish on the floor, okay, pick it up. I may not have put it there, but if I let it go and everybody else lets it go, well, the rubbish isn't going to move. No, exactly. Someone's got to move it. Right. And I'm the same. I do the same. Uh, like I'm, I'm the sort of the master instructor of our care. I mean, if I see something on the floor, I grab it. I'm yep. the first one to grab it. Yep. So when the other instructors or members see that, oh, well, grandmaster's moving and I've I, I got to do the right thing too. Mm. Well, uh, we've in my, when we were growing up, our martial arts was just mainly for – kids that wanted to fight and all that mm. but now my instructors are all educated people they're all uni graduates mm. 
And that's why I emphasize a lot on education. Yep. And I think that's probably why we're very successful because all our instructors are highly educated. They're the living role models. Mm. And we emphasize a lot on education. All every end of each class, we have match chats. Yep. We talk to young kids about, you know, whatever it may be. If it's little kids, it could be a respect and balance and all that for teenagers and kids that are about 11, 12, peer pressure, mm. drugs, and, you know, making sure that they study, making sure that they always read a book, yep. making sure that they, uh, you know, try their best. We award kids. We have academic achievement awards. So the kid, if a kid uh, brings an award from school, yep. we give them a badge that goes on their uniform. Oh, wow. So these kids are always trying to challenge yeah, getting each other. recognition. Yeah, recognition at yep. the academy. Yep. So if the kid did something at school – could be you know a hundred meter race they came first or whatever they bring that award mm. while everyone's sitting down a everyone jack just you know won the hundred meter race in the school let's give him a round of applause so your kid gets the gets the award and puts it on his uh, on his uniform yep so you, you're getting these kids to always try their best at everything they do because all you just need is a motivation with these kids mm. just to motivate them push them a little bit more and uh the, the mat chats are amazing. Parents love the mat chats because the message you're always, every time they're in a mm. class, you bring them a message, giving them a message. And teenagers these days need that message mm. because there's a lot of broken families, you know, yeah. either the kids are living with their mum or dad or vice versa. And, uh, you know, some of them don't have any as uh, one guiding them. So we're trying mm. to guide them, trying to always talk about if you have any issues at home, if anything that we can do, come and see the instructors. You know, and we give them opportunities to become instructors. We give them jobs, mm. and uh, we have up you know, programs such as uh, the leadership programs, leadership lead programs, uh, instructor development programs. Mm. Uh, a lot of the kids want you know want to be instructors because they see that the instructors are, are cool kids at our academy. So everyone wants, and we give them that opportunities. Mm. But you want to be an instructor, you're going to need to make sure you know you got to do the right thing. And then we have job list where they have to tick every day before they go for a grading it's a monthly job list where did you make your bed you know did you thank someone today mm. did you do your homework did you read a book did you um, do anything without being helped did you brush your teeth mm. so it, these things that all we we get our members to do mm. and that's probably why you know we success successful yeah. successful yeah and did were some of these things that you picked up as a as a parent yourself, as a parent, yeah, I don't think if I was a parent, I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of this stuff. Yeah, you know, what do I want for my kid? So that's how I always looked at it. Okay, well, how do I want my kid to be raised? Yeah, and uh, all my kids are educated. Like my both of my my older son, he finished Sydney Uni, he did uh, commerce. My young daughter, my daughter, she finished masters in teaching, and my young son, he just started uni this year. Yeah, you know, even I never forget. He said to me, he goes, Daddy, I don't need to go to uni because I've got a job lined up already. I go, no, you have to be the role model. You know, you have to do the right thing before you can. I can ask anyone else to do the right thing. If my kids aren't bums or if my kids don't study or I can't say to kids, mate, you've got to go to school. It's, school's important because mm. I've got to live the life. So I've got to walk to walk and talk to talk. Yep. So if anyone says to me, why aren't your kids staying? Well, they all did. Yep. You know, they all they work for me, but they also finished university as well. Mm. So. Was it was it a different feeling for you when 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 Boozer was born? Like like I always have this thing where you know it's a different. You have two different feelings when you have a son versus having a daughter. It was different because uh, we got no. There was no girls in our family, so it was three boys, and then Hakan, and then my daughter was born. She was so special to me. You know, yep. wow. <laughs> You know, I got to take care of my boys. Stay away from her, type of issue. You know, <laughs> I don't want any guy like getting close to her. You got to do martial arts. So I got all my kids started doing martial arts ever, ever since they could start walking. Yep, they grew up in the sport. Yep, even my young son, like my grandkids, they've started as well. They, uh, they're twenty two months. It's actually twenty six months now. Two twins. They started as soon as they were eighteen months old. Yep, they started training martial arts. Wow. So I see the the values are amazing. It's great to raise your kids doing martial arts because it's the discipline wise, the flexibility wise, mm. it builds their motor skills as well. Yep. Especially for little kids, you know, their motor skills strengthens up certain parts of their body. body. Yep. Yeah, and it builds their confidence up. It it gives them that nice balance. Uh, you know, it gives them that nice coordination because mm. martial arts you do everything. Yep. You know, you flip, you jump, you kick, you stretch, you punch, yep. you think, you focus, you move around, you run, you, you say any, just about every sport except swimming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> no, that's great. And then, um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, how, you know, COVID sort of impacted the business. Yeah, it has. So yeah. um, obviously, you know, when, when it all sort of came out, you, you would have had to make a lot of structural changes, right? We did. Uh, when we started hearing about it, we, we, we uh, followed the stages that the government's imposed on us. Straight away, we've, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people wanted to sort of put on a whole lot of quid because a lot of people were scared. So we said, look, we, we are sanitising. So we had uh, disinfectants everywhere. We, we got sanitised as soon as you walk into our dojo. We had mm. sanitizers, you know, uh, sanitise your hands. And after the end of each class, we had uh, wipe the pads or anything that people yep. were using. Pop it all down. Pop it all down, disinfectant. We did that for a while, but when the government actually closed us fully, uh, they, then we went on to Zoom class. We started teaching online. We were still teaching six classes every day, seven days a week because yeah. I have an amazing team. And I wanted, I told my team, I said, no matter what, I want to make sure I keep you guys. Or, uh, you know, I don't want to sack any one of them. But lucky this job keeper came along, and mm. which helped out a lot. But, uh, yeah, we we're teaching online. And hopefully this coming Saturday we're going to start reopening again. Reopening again. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of places are hoping to of, yeah. reopen. Well, and a lot of martial arts clubs have closed down. Mm, they yeah. are, they're not opening anymore. Yeah, well, I'm sure if I didn't have my team, they can teach online and do all this, uh, you know, digital stuff. Had, yeah. uh, we would have closed too. If it was me, just me, or I would have closed down and never start back up because I'm 57 now, and uh, I, you know, I'd say enough, but. And my kids are in it. It's it's a great sport. It's a great business. It's it's. I can see a lot of members. I can see a lot of families are looking up to us, and they need us. Mm. We need them. We you know we all need each other. We're all one community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. All right. Well, um, yeah, I I think we covered quite a lot. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you want to talk? Well, about? I just wanted to say thank you for coming out here, and I just want everyone to, you know, martial arts not about punching and kicking. It's not. Mm. You know, if, if parents out there want their kids to do martial arts, don't think that they're going to go out there and punch and kick and become violent and fighters. Yeah. They, they become, you know, uh, confident kids. They become mm. disciplined kids. They, be, they know how to manage their time well. You know, they know what to do, when to do as well. Learn how to problem solve. They, they solve their problems immediately. So I, I would advise every parent to take their kids to martial arts. You know, it could be any martial arts styles, but as long as the instructor, you know, teaches discipline, mm. instructors, the role model instructor does the right thing because everything is up to the instructor. You know, there, there are great instructors out there who can teach, but they, behind your back, they go and smoke mm. or they go, you know, it's funny. They're not living the lifestyle. They don't live yeah. the life. They don't teach what they preach. Yeah. I never forget, I went to Turkey and when this tournament, like in 1998, I visited a couple of schools there the guys would teach the class and then come out and smoke outside and I, they go, have a cigarette. I go, no, we don't smoke. It just felt so awkward <laughs> for me, you know. I'm going, mate, you're just teaching people fitness, teaching them discipline, but you're out here, you know, doing the wrong thing, you know, <laughs> swearing, lying. Oh, I was just, you know, you can't be a hypocrite. You've got to do the right thing. It's, it's funny, actually. Um, you just made me think about, so when I was, this would have been back in 2000 and maybe 2006 or eight or something like that. And um, me and one of the other instructors from our kung fu club, we went, we were, we went to China for some some uh, line dancing program, so for Chinese line dancing and mm -hmm. things like that. And the guys we were training with, like there was a, a few guys there who you know were all martial artists as well. Um, uh, so where we went was um, a place called Si Chow, which is in uh, Canton, in Canton Province, um, and then or, or Guang, Guangzhou basically, and then. Um, they were teaching, I, I guess, this, a similar style of martial arts to like Wong Fei Hong from those like Wong Fei Hong movies. Yeah, um, uh, that's where uh, I guess he that that style sort of originated from. And we'd be there training, and then you know, we'd, then we'd we'd stop and have a break, and then you know, half the uh, half of those instructors would all you know start sparking up a cigarette, and they'd just be smoking in the training hall. And it was just like, wow, so this is a totally different lifestyle to to you know what I guess we were used to. Yeah. Um, you know, but look, there's no right or wrong, but you got to find obviously no, no, it, what, what it works. is wrong, though. You've yeah. got to admit it. I mean, if I'm teaching, I'm, if I'm telling people not to smoke, I shouldn't smoke. Yeah, you know, it is wrong. Like, right. as much as we think it's right and wrong, but we got to be straightforward and say, look, that is wrong. Yeah, and that's why I love Australia. Australia is so good. Like, if they see some, I, you know, if they see someone smoking, one of our instructors, I never I forget, we had an office lady once in 
she was smoking and so on. I saw her smoke and I came and told her, I said, if you want to smoke, you need to, you know, stop working here. <laughs> so it's not right, you know, you, if you're running a, a, a fitness academy or martial arts yep. academy, you've got to be the leaders in the community. Mm. Why do you think I get my kids to do, do the right thing first and I try to do the right thing, you know? Mm. I'm trying all, I'm still training like now during this COVID thing, I've been, walking and running every day 10 to 15 k's mm. i gotta just sit back and relax i don't got nothing to prove now i'm ninth degree black belt you know the highest you can achieve in martial and take one do mm. i don't have to achieve anything anymore but no i still want to be the role model i still want to look great when i'm 90 mm. or 100 you know i can't be that fat guy like yes s- standing in front of a class talking about getting fit eating right yeah but i'm not doing the right yeah thing. Well, the learning never stops, right? Like even no, though it never stops. So even I'm though you, learning, you've, you reached, you've reached yeah. that level, like there's still other things that you. I'm always learning. I'm always looking at other sports, other martial arts styles, what I can bring to my, you know, our academy. My instructors are constantly revamping. Harkins always, you know, he's he's doing uh, grappling now. He's doing mm. jiu jitsu. He's been doing that for quite a few years. You know, did, I did kickboxing, boxing, judo, all those years myself, and wrestling as well as a young kid also, but. You know, we we constantly trying to bring whatever we can. We want our instructors to be all around us, our members to be all around us. Like a lot of Taekwondo schools don't have weapons, but we have a weapon system. Mm. You know, we have an upgrade program where kids we have lots of third dan, fourth dan black belts. When a lot of kids when they get a black belt, they they don't want to do it anymore. But mm. we have so many hundreds of black belts out still training because they're always learning. We have curriculums, uh, you know beyond black belt curriculums, beyond black belt programs where, you know, they get graded every six months and they, they move up to to their stripes and then first down to second, then second, then to third, then they also get graded in between as well. Mm. So they're always constantly improving. Yep. The, we, and we want them to be all around us. We yeah. want our members, our students to be good at everything, grappling, standing up, you know, uh, uh, to be confident kids all mm. around, all around yep. martial arts. And the skills translate. You know, they do. there's there's a lot of commonality, you know, between um, I guess you know when I say basic principles, they're not they're not really actually that basic, but like you know when when the thing the concepts that you can apply to distancing, inspiring yeah, as an example, exactly, yeah. like they apply on the ground, on the feet, in wrestling, like you know to be able to control distance. Yeah, this is know. very important. Yeah. yeah. So so a lot of the I guess the core principles that you can uh, develop through any martial art. Will have commonality with other martial arts. It's just in how the application of it is exactly. is used, right? Yeah, and, and some like for example, grappling is more mostly on the ground, mm. about, and and boxing is all that standing hand, and and we we like what we do. Take one that's mostly kicking as well, but we do a lot of hand, mm. we do a lot of takedowns, but we don't stay on the ground. Yep, we do a lot of self defense moves. You know, if someone grabs you, if someone pushes you, if someone, uh, you know. Or multiple attackers attack you. How do you react to all that? I'm not saying it's the best, but it's the best we can try to emulate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, It's not easy. You can't. You know, certain things you can't. You know, emulate. Like it's like, you know, uh, if you if you've never done any hard sparring before or like been in a fight, you can't emulate that feeling by doing no contact or or light contact sparring. It's it's not the same. You know, not the same. And your reactions aren't the same. Yeah, till you actually fight. Uh, in a real street fight, you never will know, you know, yep. because class training, you can say to yourself in the class, you're doing everything, but still in the class, you're still friends, you're still sort of pulling yep. back, you're still, you know, when you're you controlled. Win, yep. control, when there's someone bullies, you sort of stop, but out on the street, you don't know how it's going to end. That's it. How it's going to start, how it's going to end. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, that's great. All righty. Um, yeah. Thank you for coming on. Uh, thank you. It's, been a lot it's of fun. great pleasure. It's nice talking to you. Yep. Great to talk to you. And um, yeah, that's it, everyone. I'll talk to you guys soon.